Hi, I'm Jimmy Coe. And I'm Stephen Hawk. And we're the host of the Cosmic Sponge Podcast, where we explore the unknown from UFOs and cryptids to unexplained disappearances and ancient mysteries. If you're looking for strange stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat, jump on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or search for Cosmic Sponge on your favorite listening platform. Head on over to our website at www.cosmicsponge.com to get access to all of our content, including a full list of platforms where you can enjoy the show. Hi, Techie Joe here. I work with Ace and Knight and some of the best psychics in West Virginia to create amazing live streams and podcasts for the Psychic Coffee Shop Network. Together, we brew up great content discussing news, events, hot topics, and more, all from a psychic perspective. On the Psychic Coffee Shop, we interview amazing authors in the metaphysical realm. Coffee and Tea combines Asen with Tracy, Dottie, Natalie, or Lady Gwendolyn for the good and the bad of being a psychic. Shameless self-promotion with Dottie the Psychic talks to leading and emerging YouTubers and business owners in our community. Mountain Bears brings you the latest in LGBT news and politics. The Psychic That Plans answers the question of, well, how a psychic plans. Plus, we're live on air. We take your comments and your questions, including psychic advice questions. Check out our amazing programming, book an appointment with top psychics, and find out all the wonderful things we have to offer at PCSBnetwork.com today. The following report was written by witness Roger Marsh. It takes place somewhere between Greensburg and Latrobe, Pennsylvania. He begins, It was Tuesday, June 26, 1973. Elvis Presley was appearing in concert in Uniondale, New York. The Watergate hearings were well underway. President Nixon met this evening at the Western White House in San Clemente, California, with Russian leader Leonid Brezhnev. I was 16 years old and enjoying the summer days between my junior and senior year of high school. An aunt and uncle and their five children lived several blocks from my home in Mountain View, East High Acres, outside of Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and I had driven there this evening, parked in front of their home, and was standing along Seminary Drive with several of my cousins and friends just after dark. As we were standing there talking, we looked up into the sky and noticed a very peculiar sight. An object the color of the moon, oval-shaped, and just above the treetops, was silently gliding above the street in the distance. I recall at first that it appeared in the distance to be about the size of a full moon. We looked, and we watched, and personally, I could not fit what I was seeing into the long list of mental pictures of what I knew was built to fly. There was a strange awe as the lighted shape drifted immediately overhead and then disappeared as it passed over the gates of what was then St. Joseph's Seminary. The moment that I tend to lock into when recalling this sighting is that point when the object was directly above me. I would guess the size to be about 30 feet across and the entire object roughly the color of the full moon and about 30 feet in the air. There was an eerie feeling as it moved. It was silent, but there was a wispy sound one might hear when a weighted object is moving through the air. This definitely appeared to be a solid object moving in a controlled manner. It had followed the path of Seminary Drive, coming from the direction of Mountain View Drive. At the point where Seminary Drive makes a 90-degree turn at the Seminary Gates, it continued in a straight line over the gates. The land within St. Joseph's Seminary slopes down to Route 30, and the object appeared to remain at the stationary 30 feet off the ground as it moved away from us and towards Route 30, until it fell out of sight. After the light passed, I remember looking the opposite direction, down Seminary Drive behind me, and seeing four or five homeowners and their families, those who just happened to be out in the front yards, standing in awe and staring in the direction of the seminary. I immediately went to my uncle's home and telephoned my father, and then I drove to my home to talk with him about what I had just seen. As I pulled into the driveway, friends of my parents and their children pulled into the driveway as well. 
They got out of their car and told my father how they had just seen the strange light passing over their home on the other end of the neighborhood, and they were convinced that it was a UFO. After we all talked for several minutes, it was decided that the best sky viewing spot was from the front yard of our friend's home, and we all drove there to watch. After an hour of sky gazing, my father went home, but I stayed with the neighborhood group that had grown to about 25 people. About an hour later, a series of two more strange phenomena occurred. In the distant sky above, a much smaller light appeared. It was the same color, like the color of the moon, but appeared much smaller and much farther out in the sky. The object streaked across the sky at a very fast rate, and then came to a sudden stop. It stayed in this stationary position for several minutes, and then made a sudden move downward and stopped again. Then it moved to the right a short distance and stopped again. And then it moved upward at a tremendous speed, stopping at about the altitude it had been at originally. It stayed in this spot momentarily, and then moved to the right a short distance, and then speeded downward again to the lower stopping altitude. It stayed in this position for several minutes, and then it whisked itself upward and off to the right at a very quick speed, and finally disappeared from sight. Within just several minutes of its disappearance, two jets moved into the same sky area and did formation-like movements in the sky, and then moved off in the same area that the UFO moved to. Now again, several minutes passed, and two small planes came in, also in a formation-like move, circling the area, and they too moved off into the sky in the same direction. We watched and the sky was silent for possibly another hour. And then the entire scene replayed itself exactly as it had the previous hour. The strange light appeared again in the sky, streaking across the horizon and stopping in the same spot, then moving downward rapidly, then moving to the right, then up again, then to the right, and then down again, and finally flying up and off to our right and disappearing. Again, the two jets came flying close together, circling the area, and then flying off in the same direction. The two light aircraft came as well, making the same formation circles, and again, flying off in the same direction as the UFO. This account is just one instance of many, many strange sightings that were reported to investigator Stan Gordon starting in 1973 and throughout 1974. What began with a few scattered reports of lights in the skies ended with UFO landings, encounters with Bigfoot-type entities, possible psychic attacks, and interference from a mysterious, secretive group of men in black. Tonight, we will examine these mysterious events that dominated southern Pennsylvania in the mid-70s through the book Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook by Stan Gordon. I'm your host Jason, and you're listening to the Esoteric Book Club. Welcome back, goblins! Tonight, we are talking about the weirdness that surrounded southern Pennsylvania in the mid-70s. But first, we need to do a little housekeeping. Before we get started, I want to thank the members of the Esoteric Archive. Specifically, Annie Kay, Soul Rising Studios, and Grand Inquisitor Samantha. Your support helps to pay server costs, purchase reading material, and helps to make sure that my blood has a measurable amount of caffeine. I really need to get a side gig selling this stuff to vampires. All members of the Esoteric Archive get early access to shows, and anyone pledging $3 or more get extended episodes. That said, I'm going to be changing some things up in 2023. 
I did a brief survey only to find out that most people enjoy the magic encrypted content, but only about half of you appreciate the news briefs. To be honest, the news briefs tend to take longer to assemble and yield a shorter episode overall. Generally, only about one in five articles even makes the show. It's not that the other articles are bad, they just aren't entertaining content. So here's my plan. When I first began the Esoteric Book Club, I did a book review and a few article reviews every full moon. I'm going to go back to doing this. In place of the regular news brief episodes, I'm going to switch over to something more like an editorial or a discussion on current topics. If you heard the Esoteric Footnotes episode entitled, What Does It Mean?, you'll have a good idea of what I want to do with this. Coincidentally, that was one of my best received episodes to date. But if I'm only going to read one or two articles each month, how are people going to get their fill of the esoteric news briefs? Well, here's the answer. The Esoteric Archive. I will continue to collect articles, and when I get about 10 good ones, I will produce an episode that will be exclusive to Archive members. That's right, the Esoteric News Briefs will now be Patreon-only episodes. At what tier can you get these, you may ask? I am creating a new category known as the Curator, which will be a $5 a month donation. At this patron level, you will get early access to shows and the exclusive Esoteric News Briefs episodes. But wait, there's more. I am also working on an Esoteric Book Club Discord server for fans of the show. This server, when it's open, will be available to everyone, but there will be a hidden board just for those pledging at the Curator, Archivist, and Chronicler levels. I'm hoping this will generate more communication between fans of the show without the possible ridicule factor that comes from more public social media platforms, such as Instagram or Facebook. So, for those of you who skipped through all of that, in short, the Esoteric News Briefs will be replaced by the Esoteric Footnotes, an editorial-style episode. A few news articles will be incorporated into each book club episode, and finally, the Esoteric News Briefs will be exclusive to members of the Esoteric Archive, starting at the newly created Curator level, which will only be $5 a month. Additionally, there will soon be a Discord server for fans of the show, so watch for an announcement of its opening. Now that we have all of that out of the way, let's get weird. Coming to us from LiveScience.com On November 22nd, a green fireball was seen streaking across the skies of Canada and the United States before crashing into Lake Ontario. The fireball, now named 2022 WJ1, was viewed from Ontario to Maryland and every place in between. Astronomers now believe that it was a small asteroid that entered the atmosphere, slowed down, and began to burn. What caused this to slow down? Basically, it's the friction of the atmosphere pushing back against the velocity of the object. This friction creates heat, which in turn causes the object to burn. In the case of 2022 WJ1, the green flame indicates that the asteroid likely had a large quantity of copper. While this story isn't really entertaining, remember the trajectory for later on in this episode. The asteroid entered the atmosphere over Canada and moved in a southeasterly direction towards Pennsylvania. This next article comes to us from the blog Old Ways for Modern Times, courtesy of Patheos Pagan. The article is entitled Winter Witchery, Five T's for the Season. The article begins by saying, With an additional heap of intention, teas become small potions in cute cups. 
Each herb used in these deliciously crafted beverages has a metaphysical correspondence, but many of them have medicinal benefits as well. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sold. Most of my experience with tea comes in the form of small paper packets steeped in hot water. Add sugar and milk and you're done. Clearly, I'm not a kitchen witch. What I appreciate about this article is that the five teas have varying degrees of complexity. The simplest one being mint tea, which reads, Heat water, add mint. Done! I think I can do that one. That said, the spiced tea recipe sounds delicious, consisting of cinnamon, cloves, ginger, and peppercorns, all steeped with black tea. The one I'm most excited to try myself is the apple cinnamon tea. It uses two cups of water, one sliced apple, one cinnamon stick, and a green tea tea bag. You very simply combine the water, apple, and cinnamon in a pot, simmer that for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then you add the hot liquid to a cup where you steep the green tea bag. This seems simple enough. But how is this witchery? That aspect comes in the form of the correspondences. Apples are associated with love and healing. Cinnamon provides success, power, and protection. And green tea is for protection and love. Add in some honey and you get the added benefit of love, success, and prosperity. Sure, you can just make this tea because it's tasty. But if you focus on the task while you craft it, it becomes a potion. Say out loud why you're adding the apples. Is it for the healing aspect or the love aspect? Is the cinnamon there for success or protection? You get the idea. I've spoken before about how different items are assembled for spells based not on their physical characteristics, but on their magical correspondences. Basically, like attracts like. In the case of these five teas, the spell just happens to be rather tasty. Now it's time to transition into the main section of the show with the book Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook by Stan Gordon. Stan Gordon may not be a name that many of you recognize, but in my neck of the woods, it tends to pop up when things get strange. Stan is a Pennsylvania native and first became interested in UFOs in 1959. In fact, he remembers the specific incident that triggered his lifelong obsession. For his 10th birthday, he was gifted his own radio. Like I mentioned, this was in 1959, so getting a radio would be like a modern kid being given access to the internet. It gave him the freedom to listen to whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted to. On October 30th of that year, the local radio station hosted a call-in show for listeners who had scary stories that they wanted to share. They told tales of everything from ghosts and goblins to reported actual encounters with UFOs or Bigfoot. This enchanted 10-year-old Stan, who went on to research everything he could find on these topics. He began to watch the newspapers for any strange encounters, and, even at a young age, he would contact the witnesses so he could interview them himself. 1965 solidified his interest in UFOs when a strange vessel crash-landed in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. Allegedly. On the evening of December 9th, a fireball was seen streaking across the sky over Ontario, Detroit, and eventually Pittsburgh. The citizens of Kecksburg were the ones who received the biggest surprise when several people reported a loud thump in the woods that sounded as if something had fallen from the sky. Pennsylvania State Troopers and the Air Force searched the area, and it was officially announced that nothing was found. Again, 
allegedly. Most scientists at the time went on record saying that they believed it to be a meteorite. Despite this, a local resident, who was 10 years old at the time, recalled watching military personnel load an object the size of a Volkswagen Beetle onto the back of a flatbed truck and cover it with a tarp before driving away. This all took place when Stan Gordon was 16 years old. He was enthralled by everything surrounding the incident, and it solidified his passion for UFO research. Four years later, at the age of 21, he had a secondary phone line installed in his home just to receive UFO reports. He dubbed it the UFO Hotline, and, little did he know, that it would soon be keeping him up at night. In 1970, he established the Westmoreland County UFO Study Group, which gave him a pool of interested people to utilize as additional researchers. He began working with local newspapers, reporters, and the police. Anytime someone got word of a weird story, they gave the person the number to Stan's UFO hotline. By the time the really weird stuff began to happen, Stan was already a veteran. While a bulk of the encounters took place between 1973 and 1974, things technically began in 1972. While investigating the locations of reported UFO sightings, investigators began to notice clumps of thin, shredded material. These clumps looked almost like random metallic bird's nests. Several people compared them to chaff used by the Air Force to throw off radio signals. Some of this material was submitted for analysis, and it was found to be mostly comprised of aluminum, but not the same type used for military-grade chaff. Completely unrelated to the discovery of this mystery material, residents along Humphrey Road outside of Greensburg began to report hearing high-pitched screams coming from the woods. Sometimes they could hear something heavy moving through the understory. What they didn't realize was that people living on the opposite end of the same wood lot were reporting exactly the same thing. On that same road in May of that year, two locals were out for an early morning walk when they witnessed a broad-shouldered, dark-colored, bipedal creature chasing two dogs. On July 4th, a bright ball of light was seen passing over that same area where these sightings took place. Eventually, it made a sharp 90-degree turn before flying off into the distance. On July 18th, residents who lived across from Humphrey Road noticed two glowing orange balls of light hovering within the branches of some trees. By October of that year, people began reporting jet black chimpanzees or gorillas on their properties at night. One poor family, who had just moved to the area, seemed to have been plagued by the creatures. The following account comes directly from the book. It was about three o'clock one morning when one of the family members and her friend pulled into their driveway. It was very dark and there was a heavy rain at the time. They turned out the car lights and the driver reached down to get her house keys. While still in the vehicle, the two people suddenly found themselves being thrown to and fro. Something was lifting and shaking the small car, causing the passengers to be thrown about. This frightening situation lasted for several minutes, then ended as suddenly as it began. The car had been moved a distance from where they had parked. Encounters in that area continued to escalate. In one instance, a St. Bernard got mauled in the night. In another, Three witnesses confront the creature, only to flee in terror once they are close enough to see its face. In another, a young girl is traumatized when she sees a tall, hairy man with pointed ears standing in her yard in the middle of the night. In a final incident in that area, 
a young man decided to take a late-night walk through the woods while his friends were partying nearby. It was specifically noted that this individual was not drinking that night. After a short time, he was found unconscious with his face swollen and bruised. The man was adamant that he had not fallen and insisted that something had hit him. Soon after he was taken to the hospital, some of the group sighted a large hairy creature and shots were fired. Witnesses say they followed a blood trail into the woods, but they decided to stop pursuing their quarry and return to the house. As 1972 turned over to 1973, Stan says, quote, We began getting reports on day one. Seriously, January 1st, 1973, the UFO hotline was already getting reports of lights in the sky. Before we go any further, I want to do a quick description of the common features of many of these UFO reports. Most of these reports involve red, green, and blue lights that remain lit, or at least some combination of these three colors. They also tend to have a secondary light source that emits orange light. This could range from something resembling exhaust all the way to the stereotypical tractor beam lifting objects into the sky. Now anyone who has ever looked at an airplane in the night sky will recognize that red and green lights are pretty common. They are used by commercial aircraft to delineate which side of the plane is oriented in which direction. The right wing has a green light on the tip, and the left wing tip has a red light. The tail fin will also have a white light, which, in some instances, could appear blue. Additionally, modern aircraft will also have anti-collision lights on their back and belly. These lights are reddish-orange and are used, as the name implies, to prevent collisions. All of these lights have one thing in common, though. They all flash. Of course, lights from planes flying at higher altitudes don't seem to be flashing due to distance, but they also generally fly in straight lines. 90-degree turns are basically impossible. The lights are pretty much the only thing that these UFO reports have in common. Throughout the next two years, Gordon and his team would receive all manner of descriptions of things in the skies. These range from glowing spheres of lights to cigar-shaped to black triangles and even the 1950s era dome-topped saucers. Gordon even admits in his book that, quote, Many of the UFO sightings reported appeared to be just misidentifications of natural or man-made objects. Quite a number of these UFO sightings reported around the Westmoreland County area were determined to be a lighted night flying advertising craft that operated out of Latrobe Airport. What remains in this book are the outliers, the strange, and the unexplained. Some of these reports are quite simple. For example, Witness reported a strange object hovering over the railroad tracks, while another object hovered nearby. That's it. Another early report reads, A woman reported observing a red spherical object that had depressions on the top of it. The object moved through the sky and made a bumping sound. I'm honestly not exactly sure how to interpret that. But that gives you an idea of what is left after the Westmoreland County UFO Study Group investigated. At this stage, there seems to have been at least one UFO sighting that could be described as unidentified every two weeks or so. Sure, there were flaps, such as the night of March 20th when there were three different reports from three different sources describing three different craft. 
One of those reports came directly from a pair of patrolling police officers who were witnessing the objects over top of a housing complex. What makes all of this really odd is how the increase in UFO reports seems to coincide with an increase of Bigfoot reports. The creatures described by most witnesses all seem to share a similar set of characteristics. Obviously, they're all hairy, with dark brown or black fur, although later on there are a few reports of a white Bigfoot. About half of the witnesses describe a horrible, rotten smell that often precedes the creature's appearance. If they don't notice a stench, there will probably be a high-pitched whining sound, similar to that of a baby crying. If the beast is nearby, people will describe a wheezing sound, almost as if it's having difficulty breathing. Once the creature gets close enough, that's when people start to notice weird details, such as pointed ears, glowing red eyes, or how out of proportion its arms seem to be in relation to its body. They are often described as hanging well below the creature's knees and remaining completely motionless when the creature is walking. The one key piece of evidence that is sometimes found after the incident are the footprints. These are not your standard Bigfoot tracks. These creatures leave behind massive three-toed footprints. The toes are huge, often in scale with the width of two or three toes seen on other primates. The best of these prints show dermal ridges and crease lines where the joints would be on the toes. If these were faked, they were really, really well done, especially for the 1970s. Now, for those of you who have seen the miniseries Hellier, you'll find this next part interesting. Not only did these creatures have only three toes, they were often seen in relative proximity to abandoned coal mines. Things were progressing to a point where the Westmoreland County UFO Study Group was working in shifts at Gordon's home just so they could man the phone lines 24 hours a day. Things were getting that intense. The Greensburg police station even created a special code red signal that alerted Gordon of an incoming report. This signal was broadcast over the Westmoreland County Civil Defense and Fire Dispatch radio channel, and it let him know to call the dispatch for details. It was even rumored that some patrol officers in that area had begun carrying high-caliber arms in their vehicles, just in case. One of the outliers in this rash of sightings comes to us from the town of Buffalo Mills on August 19, 1973. Gordon picked up this account well after the incident, though he includes it in the book due to the high strangeness aspect of it. Around 8 p.m., several locals were startled by the sudden appearance of a nine-foot-tall human-like being. This entity was dressed in shiny clothing of an unusual design and was calmly walking down the center of the street in town. They never spoke, nor did they come across as threatening. They just walked. Then, as suddenly as they appeared they seemed to vanish. Now don't read too much into that last part, though. Vanish is used in the metaphorical sense here. None of the witnesses saw where they came from, nor where they went. They just lost sight of the person, and suddenly, they were gone. It's at this point in the book that I began to pay attention to the dates on the recorded reports. Once you notice this, you can get a sense of the sheer number of calls that must have been coming in, because there are several pages of reports just for August 19th and 20th. This is also where third parties begin to get involved. In one incident, 
a field investigator named Ken went to check on a reported sighting. He was met by a husband and wife who were toting a shotgun and Bible respectively, while their German shepherd was so frightened that he wouldn't leave his doghouse. Ken interviewed the couple and investigated the area, where he found two hair samples that were exceptionally smelly. He contacted Stan Gordon and let him know that he was mailing in his case report, along with one of the hair samples. That report never arrived. After a few days, Stan called Ken back to make sure that he had actually put the report in the mail. Ken assured him that he had, but while on the phone, they began getting strange metallic interference. Ken even commented that Stan didn't sound like himself on the phone. This interference continued throughout other phone calls, but it seemed to only happen when the discussion turned towards Bigfoot. That wasn't the end of Ken's difficulties either. He was a rather meticulous investigator who had a filing cabinet where he stored all of his case files. Randomly, one day he went to file some paperwork, only to find that everything involving his Bigfoot research was gone. Nothing else seemed out of place. Any other paperwork stored in the filing cabinet remained untouched. The Bigfoot files just seemed to have vanished. Then came the incident with the mysterious man from Ohio. It all began with some strange encounters with Bigfoot at the Superior Mobile Home Court. The big hairy guy was peeping in some windows, scratching up siding, and damaging some air conditioning units. Stan and his crew had been there to investigate several times, and in one instance, they had found some bizarre three-toed footprints. At some point, Stan received a call from someone who we will call Beverly. Now, Beverly had previously left a message, which Stan never received, and had been calling all afternoon trying to get in contact with him. It was apparently a pretty busy day. Now, she reported that one of the creatures had pulled out her electrical wire from the side of her trailer on August 24th. Four days later, a man shows up at her place and he introduced himself as an investigator from Ohio. He even had a badge with his name on it. What that badge actually said is still unclear. He was described as short, a little heavy set, wearing a gray work uniform and a strange belt with a face on it. He was driving a normal looking station wagon that did indeed have Ohio plates. He assured her that he was here on Stan's behalf and after talking to him a bit, she gave him a hair sample that she had collected. While this was going on, one of the neighbor kids came over and took a Polaroid photo of some of the tracks. The strange man seized the photo from the boy, who in turn said, I just made a picture! The man replied, No, you have just made us a picture. And then he crumpled it up and stuffed it into his pocket. He asked the witness about the tracks, took measurements that he recorded in a journal, and then proceeded to scuff the tracks with his foot, destroying them. By this time, the neighbors had all gathered, and they were all quite upset with his behavior. They told him that they were calling the cops, at which point he got into his car and sped away so quickly that he almost rolled the vehicle. It was never determined who this guy was, and he was never seen again. To this day, no one knows how he got the witness's contact information. As with any community-based panic, rumors had begun to spread. Several stories were circulating, heard by a friend of a friend, though no one could ever really verify them. One of the most popular ones involved a farmer who came home and heard animals in his barn raising a ruckus. When he investigated, he discovered a Bigfoot, which he shot and killed. He called the police to report the incident, but instead, it was government agents who arrived at his farm. They took the remains and strongly suggested that he never talk about the incident. 
While Stan tried to find out who the farmer was and where the incident took place, the story could never be verified. As panic set in around the area, several citizens decided to seek assistance from elected officials. This culminated with Stan being interviewed by two representatives of Congressman John H. Dent. They listened to his summary of the situation, observed the evidence that he had collected, and were generally polite. They left him contact information and apparently kept in touch with him as the rash of sightings continued. Overall, the sightings and encounters continued to increase in both frequency and in high strangeness until, as suddenly as they began, they quickly began to dwindle. By the end of 1974, there were very few sightings, and they mostly came down to seeing some strange lights in the sky. So what exactly took place in southern Pennsylvania at this time? To this day, no one is really sure. The test results for many of the hair samples collected generally came back as either human or black bear. The strange three-toed tracks have yet to be identified. The identity of the strange man from Ohio has never been discovered, nor the identity of the farmer who supposedly shot the Bigfoot. Despite all the strangeness surrounding this event, everything just seems to have ended. There was no larger-than-life finale, no culmination. It all just stopped. We still don't know what was behind the silent invasion. This book was wild. Not just in an exciting edge-of-your-seat kind of way, but more like a slowly building narrative of high strangeness. There's a good balance of Stan Gordon's recollections and case file entries. Not all the entries are entertaining, but the ones listed all serve a purpose, even if that purpose is to demonstrate a regular location or time period. The weird stories, though, are really, really weird. I'll get into some of those in the Patreon extension. So if you want to find out more about the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot flap of the 1970s, check out Silent Invasion by Stan Gordon. As always, I'll have a link in the show notes. The Esoteric Book Club can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, and at esotericbookclub.org. Intro and outro music is from the song Fight Don't Fight, courtesy of Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June. You can find more of their work at bandcamp.com or at wearehellojune.com. Archive members, stick around. We're going to hear about a few of the most bizarre incidents from this event. For the rest of you, until next time, remember, stay weird. On September 1st, 1973, Stan Gordon received a report from a rather serious man who was calling on behalf of a trio of women. They had had an encounter that they wanted to report, but were afraid to do so, thinking that they would be ridiculed for their statements. As a result, this gentleman decided to file the report for them. The women were traveling on a country road near Penn Township when they noticed a large UFO sitting on the ground. They said it was metallic-looking and rectangular in shape. They slowed their vehicle to observe, when suddenly, a door-like structure appeared on the side of it. A series of steps extended, and two very tall, hairy, Bigfoot-like creatures exited the vehicle and fled into the nearby woods. Hey everyone, Natalie here from The Pendulum's Path. If you need guidance, direction, spiritual connection, or more, then listen up. 
I have worked as a psychic and a medium for over three years, connecting people from all over the world with their loved ones in spirit, giving them insight and guidance into their current situations, the past healings that need to be worked on, and what it is they need to know today in order to have a better future. It would be my absolute honor if you would visit my website at www.thependulumspath.com. I also offer emailed readings for those with busy schedules too. Also, for you goblins who subscribe to the Esoteric Book Club, I have a special coupon code just for you. Enter the code STAYWEIRD to get $5 off of any order of $25 or more. Hope to see you there.